Thank you, Val, for praying. And uh, Brian, thanks for leading. And thanks to the musicians for, for leading us in worship. Uh, good morning. My name is Andy Newberry. And uh, I'm a volunteer teacher and preacher here at Park Church. And I'm really excited to, to get to deliver the message this morning. Um, recently, my wife Sharon and I just got back from a trip to Korea where we went to go visit a whole lot of family there. Uh, we went there with my mom, who is originally from Korea. So in case some of you are sitting here wondering, like someone asked me this week, where exactly is Andy from? <laughs> the answer is New Jersey. Um, but originally, yes, my mom is from South Korea, and my dad was originally from Rhode Island. Uh, this is now the, the third summer that my mom has been going out and traveling to Korea to visit her brothers and sisters and all of their kids. Uh, for me and Sharon, it was a great time to get to go to Korea because for me, it was my first time going to see Korea as an adult. And I was really excited to see my mom's former country while she's still active and mobile enough to show us around and to see the place. Um, before I was born, my parents, they lived all over the world because they were both career military people. My dad was in the U.S. Army, my mom was in the South Korean Army, uh, but a few years after they got married, they ended up settling down here in New Jersey. Um, I was born right around the corner here at Fort Monmouth, and uh, I just, this is where I grew up. I had visited Korea once when I was a kid, like maybe around 10 years old, but like I said, my trip there this summer was my first time to see the place as an adult. And it was a great trip, it was awesome, I got to see a lot of family. Some of them I had never met before, some of them I had only met once, just briefly decades ago. And I loved how much they welcomed us, and they really made me and Sharon feel at home. I really appreciated the way that they made my wife feel a part of the family and helped her to fit in. I also loved all of the delicious Korean food that they kept packing into us. Um, I am still trying to work that off. Um, but I laugh when I think about my first trip to Korea when I was a little kid. Because I grew up here in Monmouth County, and growing up in Monmouth County, New Jersey in the 70s and the 80s, I didn't exactly see a lot of Koreans. And I saw even less half Koreans. Um, I'm the youngest of three brothers, and so every time I went to school, every teacher knew exactly who I was before I even knew them. <laughs> They're like, oh, you must be one of the Newberry boys, was a, a common refrain I would hear. And, and so I was used to feeling different, and I was used to standing out in the crowd. And for me, it was also easy to, to spot my mom in a crowd because she was the only you know, five-foot-tall, dark-haired, serious-looking Korean woman that I would see. <laughs> but I laugh when I think about that first trip of mine to Korea because when I went there, um, you know, we flew to Korea, we're at the airport, and then for a brief moment, my mom leaves my brother and me while she goes off to, to look for her sister. And while she's off looking for her sister, I had this moment of panic because it was almost like the Rhode Island side of me had the most stereotypical response to seeing a room full of Koreans. And I thought, oh man, <laughs> yeah, they all look the same. <laughs> It's as uncomfortable for me to say that as it is for you to hear it, but, but I, I panicked and, and I was worried that, oh no, like, I'm not going to be able to spot my mom in this crowd of five foot tall, dark haired, serious looking Korean women. Um, but then out from the crowd, my mom reemerged and instantly I recognized her. My, my panic subsided, my fears were unfounded, and, and I realized yeah, of, of course I'm going to recognize my mom. That, that's my mom. I literally would recognize her anywhere in the world because she's my mom, because she is the face and she is the voice that I've heard since I've been born. And I'm sure that for each of us, we have funny stories that we could share about our families and talk about things that made us feel different or talk about things that made us feel like we stood out in a crowd. And, and I also know that so many of us come from families that look so different from that 1950s Leave it to Beaver TV sitcom sort of a family. I mean, so many of us come from blended families, ethnically diverse families. We come from single parent families. Some of us have adopted siblings or step siblings. We all have that weird aunt or that uncle we don't talk about in polite company. Um, and maybe for some of you, 
you miss that. You miss feeling like you're a part of a family. Or maybe for some of you, actually, maybe for some of you, you never really felt like you fit into your family. And if that's you, then we are especially glad that you're here because we want you to know that you are welcomed here into this family that God is building at Park Church. Today, we're going to talk about being a part of God's family. And my hope for us is this, that we're going to see that God's family might not look like what we expect, but it may be far more beautiful than we ever realized. So we're beginning a new series today entitled The Bright Life, Living in Light of Who We Are. It, it comes from this passage in Ephesians 5.8 where it says, For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. So we're going to take time this summer to shed light on who God is and who we are, and then we're going to challenge ourselves to live in light of who we are. And we're going to do that by walking through the New Testament book of Ephesians. This book, Ephesians, can enlighten us about how we can become a part of God's family, who we are in God's family, and what we're supposed to do in God's family. We're also going to see some big ideas in the Christian faith, such as salvation, the Trinity, and the church. We're also going to look at some immensely practical topics, such as how to have a better marriage, how to help raise your kids or to interact with your parents, and how to deal with conflict. And so to set our expectations, it might help to know how to approach a book like Ephesians. Um, Ephesians is a type of literature in the Bible it, called an epistle, which basically just means it's a letter. And in epistles, they usually, in the New Testament, the author is usually sending a letter to a church or a group of churches in a particular city. And the apostle Paul, he wrote a lot of the epistles of the New Testament. And usually when Paul wrote his epistles, they would come in two parts. The first part would be descriptive, and the second part would be prescriptive, which means this. The first part of his letters, his epistles, would begin with something descriptive, where he describes God, he describes the church, he describes us. And then the second part is prescriptive, meaning he gives instruction, he prescribes what we're supposed to do given this description of who we are. And so as we look through the book of Ephesians, we'll expect to see these descriptive passages telling us about God and ourselves, followed by these prescriptive passages telling us what we're supposed to do. So today we're gonna to focus on the description and the prescription of living in light of who we are as members of the family that God is building. So when Sharon and I went to Korea, we brought with us a family photo album of all of the New Jersey family. So we had pictures of my mom and dad, we had pictures of me and Sharon and my two brothers and uh, my oldest brother's wife and his kids. And we brought this family photo album because we wanted the Korean side of the family to get to see the New Jersey family. And uh, it made it a lot easier for my Korean family to understand the New Jersey side of the family when they saw for themselves pictures of who we are. And so in this passage we're gonna look at today, it's an introduction into God's family. And it's kind of like Paul is showing these Christians in Ephesus a family photo album, but he's doing it with words instead of with pictures. And so in this album, he describes the divine family of God, the Trinity, where he talks about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He shows them pictures of who God is by showing them what God has done. And he paints this beautiful picture of God's family. And while he does that, he points out periodically throughout this picture that the Christians in Ephesus, that they're in that picture too. And I hope that we see that we're also in that family picture and that it tells the story of how we get to be a part of God's family through adoption. And so in the original Greek of that passage that Valerie read and that we're gonna look at today, uh, in English, that's broken up into about six fairly lengthy sentences, but in the original Greek, that's just one really long sentence of 202 words. 
Um, it, it's as if it, the way it reads, it's like Paul is so excited to get to tell these Ephesian Christians about God that he's breathlessly running through idea after idea about how amazing God is and how great it is to be a part of God's family. And so we're going to look at this description of God and his family, and then we're going to consider the prescription of how to live in light of who we are as members of God's family. So it begins with this in Ephesians 3. It says, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The passage begins with the phrase, Blessed be God. The word for blessed is eulogetos, from which we get our English word eulogy. Um, eulogy, it just means literally a good word. There we go. Um, and it, Paul is simply saying this, this. The foundation of this whole extended sentence is to say a good word about God our Father and the family that he is building. It's my privilege and I'm excited to get to preach here and I get to preach occasionally here but also at other places. But I have to tell you, um, the hardest message that I ever delivered was about two and a half years ago when I gave the eulogy for my dad. Um, my dad was a career army man. Um, he did a lot, he was in Germany, Korea, Vietnam. Um, and so when he died, uh, his funeral was out at the old military base out by Fort Dix. And I'm sure that some of you may have loved ones who are out there and, and know what that experience is like. Because out at that cemetery, there is a constant stream of funerals. And so there's not much time to deliver a message. And so my task was to honor my dad by saying a good word about him. And the challenge for me was not saying a good word about my dad. It, it was limiting it to just a few words. And so after it was over, um, my close friends were there. My family was there. We all went out to a meal. And people periodically would gather around, and, and they would pull me aside, and they would say something like, you know, Andy, let me tell you something about your dad. And so I got to hear some great stories about a great man. And I got to hear stories about a, a man who taught me that love and gentleness and courage could all go together. That was, for me, a really tough day, but it was a good day. And I'm going to treasure that forever. And so when I read how Paul opens this letter to the Ephesians, telling them to eulogize God the Father. I remember that day, and I kind of feel like Paul is saying to these young believers, hey, let me tell you something about our dad. Let me tell you something about God our Father. God our Father, he is blessed, and he loves to bless you. God, has, God our Father has chosen you to be a part of his family. And do you want to know when he chose us? He, he chose us before you were even born. And, and do you know why he chose you? Because it made him happy to adopt you. God, our Father, delights in the fact that we get to be his sons and his daughters. And then Paul goes on to, you know, and while I'm at it, let me tell you something about God the Son. His name is Jesus Christ. And he loves you too. In fact, he has laid down his life for you so that you could be a part of his family. God the Son, Jesus, he knows everything that you've done wrong. There's no surprises. But he's forgiven you of each and every one of them. He's redeemed you. He's forgiven you at the cost of his own life. And he has made room for you to have a place in the family of God. And then Paul goes on to say, and, and you know, while I'm still at it, let me tell you about God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit loves you too. And God's Spirit, he's going to watch out for you. And he's going to make sure that you make it in this family. 
And, and God the Holy Spirit has taken on the specific role of making sure that you're going to get your full inheritance as members of God's family. This is a great eulogy that Paul gives. It's a true good word. And here's a quick mini lesson within a lesson. The word eulogy, it just means a good word. There is nothing inherent in the definition of eulogy that limits its usage to only the dead. We can still eulogize the living. Paul eulogizes the living God. And so we can eulogize the living too, and I encourage us to do that while we still can. And so this eulogy is so beautiful. This family photo album is so rich that there are a few snapshots of God's family that I want us to look more closely at. And in doing so, I'll say up front, I wanted to be able to package these snapshots into two or three really snappy, neat and clean categories. Like, here's the plan, the purpose, and the person of God. Or, or here's three steps to find your place in the family of God. But that's just not the way this 202-word long sentence presents itself. Um, th this picture, it's more of a collage than a diagram. So the way we're going to approach it is this. We're going to see the big picture, which we just did, and then we're going to narrow our focus in on just a few particular passages to see what stands out to us. And so here's a second quick mini lesson within a lesson. That's a great way to do your own personal Bible study. See the big picture, and then narrow your focus in to a few specific ideas and phrases that jump out at you. So let's look at this one. In verse 4 it says, Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. So here we see that God chose us before the foundation of the world. I like that word chose because it means we're not an accident. We weren't an afterthought. We weren't a mistake. God chose us. Think about it. When we choose something, what do we do? We think about it. We deliberate about it. We are intentional about it. God, our Father, thought about us. He deliberated about us. He was intentional in choosing us. We were not an accident or an afterthought. We were on purpose. God premeditated that we would be in his family. And when did God choose us? It says that he chose us before the foundation of the world. This means that before God laid the foundation for the world, God laid the foundation for you to have a relationship with him. And, and notice how it says we were chosen to be holy and blameless. It doesn't say that we were chosen because we were holy and blameless. The picture of how and why God our Father loves us, it's just so different than all of the other images of love that our world, that our culture presents to us. When I had that childhood moment of panic, when I thought, oh no, I'm not going to recognize my mom in this room full of other similar looking people, I realized that, you know what, we may have moments when we have a hard time recognizing God, our Father, in the midst of all of these competing images of what love looks like. One of the images of love that has really permeated our culture and tradition for a long time is encapsulated in this old Greek myth of Pygmalion. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, but in the Greek myth of Pygmalion, there was this artist and king, and what he did is he took a a slab of marble, and he starts chipping away at it, carving away, and he starts to make a statue of a woman. And he, he's kind of OCD about this because he just does not stop working at the statue until it becomes perfect. And he makes the most beautiful woman that anyone in that culture had seen. And he would stare at this thing and look at this thing, and he fell in love with this image of beauty that he made. And in our modern-day culture, that idea has been told and retold in children's stories, in plays, in musicals, in movies. Probably most famously, this was redone in the play My Fair Lady, which was based on a play called Pygmalion, where there's this rich, older guy, Henry Higgins, 
who makes a bet with a bunch of his friends that he says, you know, I bet I could take some unlovely, unsophisticated woman and I could transform her into something beautiful. And, and so he finds this woman, Eliza Doolittle, and that's what he does. He transforms this woman into a sophisticated lady. And she becomes so elegant and refined and beautiful. Sure enough, Henry Higgins, he falls in love with her. And this story, um, like I said, it, it's everywhere. In each of these stories, the lesson is the same. And it's this, if you can just transform yourself into a pretty woman, or if you could get transformed into someone classier or someone who has their life together, then you could find love. So basically, get lovely, then you can get loved. It's a lousy lesson, but here's the good word about God our Father. He's no Pygmalion. That's not the way that God loves. We don't have to make ourselves beautiful in order to be loved. We don't have to get our lives in order in order to be loved by God. God loves us just as we are, just where we are. He loved us before we were even born. God loves us if and when we're a hot mess. He knows us. There's, no, there's nothing he doesn't know about us. God doesn't love us because we are beautiful, but when God loves us, his love transforms us into a people of beauty. Because when we've been loved like that, we can't help but become more beautiful. And so God's love transforms us to be people who are holy and blameless. And this happens more and more as we find ourselves in Christ. And I'll talk more on what it means to be in Christ, but I do want to make a quick observation that in this passage, there's a phrase, um, the idea that he chose this before the foundation of the world, that some people within the Christian community have formed really strong opinions about. And they end up um, having these passionate debates about how and why and when God chooses people. And in their language, it becomes a debate about predestination and free will. Uh, I am not going to encourage us to pick sides in an in-family argument that's been going on for millennia. <laughs> I am going to encourage us to remember how this verse begins. Blessed be God. The purpose of this passage is not so that we could say bad words about other members in the family of God, about whether or not they're getting God right. The purpose of this passage is to say a good word about God who loves us and to be thankful that God has blessed us. And so we'll move on to the next verse where it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. In this snapshot, we see how we can be in Christ. Jesus, uh, God's Son, has redeemed us through His blood. And, and so these phrases, redeemed through His blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses, it essentially means this. Jesus has released us from the baggage of our sin. Jesus has released us from the baggage of our sin, of our failures, of our faults. Because when we think about our families, we all have some baggage that we've been carrying with us. Um, as members of God's family, Jesus releases us from that baggage of our sin. And notice how Jesus doesn't just barely forgive us. He lavished, lavishes grace and forgiveness on us. And so we can be in Christ because he's released us, because he's forgiven us of our sins. And if there are some of you who right now are sitting here and you're thinking, you know, I don't know what I think about this whole Christianity thing. Maybe I you have doubts and you're wondering what do you believe or what you're supposed to do? How do I become a part of the family of God? Well, it comes down to this. It's acknowledging we've all sinned. And what that means is that we've all had moments of failure where we failed to love God or we failed to love others. Or there are times when in our heart of hearts, we know that we've done wrong. 
or there are times when we know that we could have done something good for someone else, but we just didn't, even when we had the perfect opportunity to do so. And the Bible calls all of that sin. And because of our sin, our relationship with God is broken. So Jesus deals with our sin, our broken relationship with God, by taking all of the guilt of our sin, putting it upon himself, and allowing himself to be nailed to a cross. And in doing that, he puts an end to our sin forever. In this perfect act of sacrificial love, Jesus frees us, he releases us, and allows us to be full members of the body of Christ. And so, towards the end of the sentence, we're going to see how to respond to that act of love, and, it, and it's going to be simply this, it's to believe, which means to accept. We can believe this by accepting the gift of forgiveness that God has given us. And so, if you've never had a clear moment of asking Jesus to forgive you of your sin, or maybe if you've never had a conscious time when you've accepted Jesus' act of sacrificial love, I'll lead us through how to do that at the end when I pray. But keep that in mind that we get to be in Christ because of the way that he's forgiven us, and we're invited to accept that grace. So the next passage goes on to say, with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So in this picture, we see that God is letting us in on a family secret. It's the mystery of his will. And what is that secret? What's the mystery of his will? Well, it's this. God will gather up all things in Christ. One day, everything, everything in heaven and on earth is going to be brought together in Christ. Things in the spiritual world and the material world, they're all going to come together. So here's part of what that means. Part of what that means is people are going to be brought together, Jews and Gentiles, husbands and wives, parents and children, because there are so many of those types of relationships that we know that have also been broken because of our sin. And God delights in restoring broken things, broken relationships, broken people, a broken world. The mystery, the secret that God is letting us in on is that God one day is going to fix all of that. That one day God will gather up all of those broken pieces, including us, and is going to restore us and make things right one day. This is going to happen, it says, in the fullness of time. In this cosmic plan that God is unfolding, it's going to work out in the fullness of time. And so, like fruit on the vine, God's plan is slowly maturing. And at some moment, the time will be ripe, and God is going to restore all things. It's hard for us to know when that moment is. Um, it's hard to know when that moment is going to be fully ready, but God knows. And what God has revealed to us is not when that moment will happen, but simply that the moment will happen. And when it does, it's good for us to be with Jesus when it does. Um, the next snapshot is this. Um, in him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. So we get to be in Christ by hearing God's word, which is a good word, which is a true word. And in fact, this good word is gospel, which in Greek is euangelion, which is good message. Um, this good message, this good news of our salvation is the gospel. And so Paul is excited that these Ephesians responded to this good news of who God is by believing, by accepting, 
by hearing this good word, this true word about who God is and saying, yeah, I, I want to be a part of God's family. Sign me up. Uh, I, and so he's excited that they responded to the gospel. And when they accepted this message, God sealed them in the family in person through the Holy Spirit. So while we're briefly focusing on this picture of God's family, I want to point out, you know how in every family there's at least that one person who doesn't like to get their picture taken? Um, God the Holy Spirit delights in directing attention towards God the Father and God the Son. But as a result, however, sometimes we don't fully appreciate fully who God the Holy Spirit is. So for example, note that I say who He is, not what it is. Um, God the Holy Spirit, He is the third person of the Trinity, and He has all the full and equal personhood that the other members of the Trinity do. And so when we refer to the Holy Spirit, we talk about who He is, not what it is, as though we were thinking that the Holy Spirit was a thing or some impersonal force. Um, later on in Ephesians chapter 4, we see that we're commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit. I can't imagine grieving a, an it or a thing. We, we grieve a person. And so we'll talk more about the Holy Spirit in later sermons, but for now we begin with just simply adjusting our perspective so that we respect the Spirit's desire to direct attention to God the Father and God the Son, but we'll do so in a way where we're not depersonalizing the Spirit in the meantime. And so what is it exactly that the Holy Spirit does for us as members of God's family? Well, basically, the Holy Spirit, He watches out for us. He's there for us. Jesus, before He was crucified, told His disciples, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit the Comforter, and He's going to be there for you. He's going to comfort you, and He's going to look after you. Jesus promised them that the Holy Spirit would come, and after Jesus died and rose again, uh, at that moment of the Pentecost later on, the Holy Spirit came and He sealed the church. And so the Holy Spirit seals and guarantees our inheritance. What this really means is that there are moments, as members of the family of God, when you just might not feel like you're really a part of the family of God. And so maybe there's times when you experience a moment of doubt or uncertainty and you think, do I really fit in? Part of what the Holy Spirit does is to just nudge you within your spirit, to remind you of God's promises and God's truths that He's going to be with you always. He's going to remind you that God has chosen you. He's going to remind you that God delighted in adopting you and saying, you or my child. There's a, a passage in another epistle that Paul writes where he says, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And so the Spirit reminds us of that, and the Spirit helps us to experience a deeper sense of belonging in the family of God. And the role of that, the Spirit, can be so helpful because I know that in every family, there are those members who totally feel comfortable and who feel like they fit in, but there's also those members who don't. There are those members who feel like they don't fit in or they feel like the black sheep or they feel awkward, but those members are no less a part of the family of God. And so when there are these members who are struggling, and maybe it's you, struggling to feel like you're trying to find your place in the family of God, the Spirit reminds us that our right to belong in God's family doesn't come from our right belief or our right behavior. It comes from God's choice to love us and to call us His sons and daughters. And so the Spirit helps us find our place in God's family, and, and He even gives us gifts so that we can meaningfully build up God's family. And so these are the snapshots. That's the family photo album that we see of God. So now that we've seen that big description of who God is, well, what's the prescription? What are we supposed to do in light of that? It's really simple. Bless the Lord. Say a good word to God the Father and say a good word about God the Father. 
We live in a culture that thrives on negativity. We turn on the news, we look at social media, and we realize that there are these billion dollar corporations that make a lot of money by, by fostering a very combative, negative environment. I think part of what God is calling us to do is to be different, to make our own choice, to say something positive, specifically to say a good word this week to God and about God. We can say that to God directly in prayer. We can say it to one another in our conversations. We can say it to ourselves to remind us of the goodness of God. There's a, a great line in Psalm 103, which says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I would love it if this week, every day this week, we just reflected on that, we meditated on that, Imagine that this is almost that family photo album that we're flipping through, and this is what we think about at the end of it, that we just want to bless the Lord. Uh, let that reorient our souls towards being thankful to God. So maybe make time in your schedule this week to say a good word to God. Make time in your schedule this week to make out a list of all the different ways that God has blessed you, and then in turn, go and bless God. Because we live in that culture with so many competing images of love, if we take the time to be with God and to get to know Him, we're going to be better at recognizing His voice, at seeing His face. If we listen closely, we're going to hear Him tell us just how much He loves us and how delighted He is that we get to be His children. He reminds us that there is room for us in His family. And who knows, maybe that good word we say about God to someone else, maybe that helps introduce someone else to become a member of the family of God. If we as a church get better at saying good words to God and about God, then we can be a better part of building God's family. So let's pray. Lord, we bless you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. God, you are good, and your word to us is good. Thank you that we could be members of your family. God, thank you for the salvation that you have given us in your son Christ. Thank you for sealing us with your Holy Spirit and helping us to find our place. God, we pray this morning specifically now for those that we wish could be a part of your family. Help us to be able to say a good word to them. Speak to them also, Lord, through your spirit to invite them into your family. Lord, we pray for those this morning who don't feel like they fit into your family. Father, we pray that you would speak words of comfort and encouragement to them to remind them that their right to belong doesn't come from their belief or their behavior, but by your choice. And God, we pray also for anyone here this morning who's never had a conscious moment or a clear time where they actively accepted your grace and your forgiveness. Father, I pray right now, if, if there is someone here like that, that they would simply confess their sin Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you that they could be in you. And so I pray now, Lord, that they would invite you to be in them, in their hearts. God, thank you. Thank you that you do come into our lives. And I pray now, Jesus, that you would fill this place. And so we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.